Hello, and welcome to our second video on how to play the bassoon. Today we're going to be talking about fingering charts, we're going to revisit the embouchure, we're going to talk about long tones and tonguing, and finally we're going to go over the first octave of notes on the bassoon from low F to open F. So this is a very standard bassoon fingering chart. Now I know this looks fairly complicated because there's just so much going on here, but we're going to break this down into easy to understand pieces. So what we use a fingering chart for is to determine which fingers or which keys or tone holes to push down to make a certain note come out of the bassoon. So we're going to go over a few examples of that at the very end of this section, mind you. But first we need to figure out how to actually read one of these things. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the first quadrant of this fingering chart. So here in this top left section, we have these separators. In this top left section, we have our left hand thumb keys. Now, if you remember, the left hand goes on the top of the bassoon and the right hand goes on the bottom of the bassoon. So starting from here, starting from the right up, I've numbered them accordingly. And then from the left up and around, I've numbered them. So here at number one, we have our whisper key. This is probably the key that we will be using most often in this first octave of notes that we're going to be learning. Number two, we have our C sharp key. Number three, we have our A flick key. Number four, we have our B flat, B, C flick key. And number five, we have our D flick key. Now, some bassoons may not actually have this D flick key. If that's the case, don't worry, you just don't need to use it. Starting from the other side, we have our low D key, our low C key, our low B key, and our low B flat key. So I think this section in particular is a little self-explanatory simply because the shapes of the keys match what's actually on the bassoon so well. However, this isn't the case for all of them, so we're going to go into more detail on some of the harder sections. So let's move on to the next quadrant. This one is also, I think, pretty easy to understand since the shapes match so well. These are our right hand thumb keys. So starting from the top, we have our B flat key. We have our E key, or as I like to call it, the pancake key. Then we have our F sharp key, and we have our thumb A flat key. Now this thumb A flat key, we will actually rarely use, and I'll tell you why when we reach the uh, right-handed tone hole quadrants. But first, we're going to talk about the left-hand tone holes. So it's important to note that our fingers do go on these holes in the instrument and not the keys. These keys are used for something else, and your bassoon also may not have these keys in the first place. So, but if they do, we're going to want to put our first finger here, our middle finger here, and our ring finger here. And then we have our left-handed pinky keys, and I'll discuss what those do a little bit later. So I've numbered these so that they match. Of course, on, I've done this on every quadrant, but here specifically, I think it becomes a little more important since the keys get a little bit more confusing. So that's the left-handed tone holes. Let's move on to the right one. I think this is probably the hardest part of the bassoon to understand just because there's so much going on here. We have this key here, this tone hole here, this thing here, this one here, then this one here, then this one here. And so if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, we have six things here, but we only have three of our fingers go in this area. So this is just a key, this is a trill key that we will use at certain times, but this isn't going to be the default position of our finger. This right here, is actually not a key at all. We, we never touch this. This is just a mechanism on the bassoon. This here is another trill key that is not the default. And then this is just a key where our finger does happen to go. So our first finger in our right hand will go here on this tone hole. Our second finger in our right hand will go here on this tone hole. Our third finger will go on this key. This is our G key. Then our pinkies will go on these three thumb keys. Now this fingering chart is a little bit uh, wonky since the pinky keys on here are not displayed where they actually are on the bassoon. You'll notice that these are to the right of these holes, while on the actual bassoon they're on the left of these holes. However, the idea is still the same. So here we have our low F key. Now here we have our pinky A flat key. Now if you remember from two slides ago, we had our thumb A flat key, and I said that this is very rarely used. Well, this is why. We have our pinky A flat key, and this is the one we use the most often. And then number six is just our pinky F sharp key. All right, so now that we've gone over how to read every single key on this fingering chart, let's look at a few examples. 
So here is the fingering chart for OpenF. An outline that's not filled in indicates something that we are not going to be pushing down, while an outline that is filled in indi indicates something that we are going to be pushing down. So here we see that our whisper key, which is just that first thumb key on the left hand, is filled in. So correspondingly, on my bassoon, I have pushed down my whisper key. Now if you play a note, you should sound an open F. Now we've actually already talked about this note, so that's why I wanted to put this one on here, just so you can put a fingering chart with something that you already know. Moving along, we have C. So in addition to putting down that whisper key in our left hand, we're also going to push down the first three tone holes in our left hand. Now, please note that I am covering these tone holes completely with my fingers. This is very important. If you don't cover them completely, the note will most likely not speak correctly. Also, you can sort of tell this from the image. My fingers are actually putting down quite a bit of pressure there, so you don't really want to hold it lightly, you want to hold it firmly. One more example, we have our B-flat. So in addition to our whisper key and our first three tone holes in the left hand, we're also going to add in some right hand action. So with our thumb, we're going to push down this first top thumb key, which is our B-flat key. Then in our right hand fingers, we're going to push down our first tone hole and our second tone hole. And we're going to hold those firmly and cover them completely. Now, you'll see that my ring finger right here and my pinky right here seem to be pushing down these keys, but I'm actually not pushing them down, I'm just resting my fingers there. This is actually a pretty good technique. When you want to, when, you, when you're playing a note, you want to try to keep your fingers as close to your keys and tone holes as possible without actually pushing them down or covering them up. All right, so now that we know how to read a fingering chart, let's move on. I want to briefly reiterate the embouchure, and then we're going to put it into context with actual bassoon playing. So again, when we are forming our embouchure around the reed, we want to pretend like we're whistling and bring our corners of our mouth in to close around the reed. Um, we're going to play with a slight overbite. We want our lips to be about halfway up the reed. We want to drop our jaw, and we want to open our throat. So again, it looks a little something like this. Now, when talking about the embouchure in context, let's go back to breathing for a second. We know that we need to breathe in properly. However, when we're actually playing, we're breathing out. So we need to know how to breathe out properly too, which is what we're going to discuss now. So when we breathe out, we can't really breathe out all willy-nilly, or it'll sound all willy-nilly on the bassoon. So what we want it to cultivate is a very steady airstream that has a constant flow of air. And the way we're going to do this is by utilizing our core muscles. So if I were to demonstrate, let me breathe in. Now I am going to push with my core as I breathe out to get that constant stream of air. And what this will allow us is to have a very steady tone and centered tone on the bassoon. So again, let me demonstrate that one more time. Now, some notes on the bassoon will require more support, and some uh, notes on the bassoon will require less support. When this is the case, when we want to use more support, we are going to engage our core more, and when we want to use less support, we are going to engage our core a little less. This will make sense more down the line. Now, let's talk about uh, breathing out. So. When we breathe in, we have talked about how we want to imagine breathing in from our back all the way up. When we're breathing out, we want to do the opposite. We want to breathe out from the top down. So we're going to breathe out from the top first, release that air, feel the air slowly move down our lungs. And eventually we're going to reach towards the end of our airstream where it's going to all be down here and we're going to have to engage our core and really suck in to push the rest of that air out. So when we reach the end of our air, you really have to push with your core 
to maintain that steady airstream even though your air is running out. And a good way to practice all of this and put it together is the long tone exercise, which uh, we'll demonstrate now. We're going to want to, we're just going to do this on open F by the way, to make it simple. We're going to play pianissimo, which means very quiet for four beats. Then we're going to crescendo to fortissimo, uh, which is as loud as you can play for four beats. Then we're going to hold out that fortissimo for four beats, then de crescendo back to pianissimo for four beats, and lastly, hold pianissimo for four beats. Now, to do this, we're going to have to change the way we're um, exhaling our air. So to play pianissimo, we have to exhale our air a little bit slower. Well, I don't want to say slower, because we really want to maintain the same airspeed as we play, but I will say you want a smaller airstream when you're playing pianissimo versus fortissimo, you want the biggest airstream possible. So, for example, if I'm just going to do this off the reed, that would be a very pianissimo airstream, whereas would be a very fortissimo airstream. So in general, we just want to use more air when we're playing fortissimo. Not because it's faster, but because there's just more air coming out of our mouth. So now I'll demonstrate the long tone. And there you have it. Now, when you practice the long tone on your own, I want you to use a metronome and try to set it to 60 beats per minute. And then, of course, hold each of those sections out for four beats as we discussed. This long tone exercise is one of the best things you can do to improve your bassoon playing from the start. Because as we're practicing this, we're really practicing how to maintain that steady airstream, which is applicable to all areas of the bassoon, as well as maintaining good intonation, which you should be playing this with a tuner, by the way, to make sure your pitch is centered. And not only that, it will also help you increase the amount of time you can play the bassoon before you need to take a break and your lips get tired. So if there's one thing you can do to improve your bassoon playing, it's the long tone exercise. So if you do this once or twice daily, you'll be amazed at how fast your improvement will be and just how much better you'll feel while playing the bassoon. It'll just make you more comfortable with it. All right. Now we're going to discuss another very important aspect of bassoon playing, and all wind playing in general, tonguing. Now, you'll notice a difference between these two notes that we're about to play. You'll notice that that second note had a much crisper attack and it was much clearer across the board. Now that is because of the tongue. So on that first note, I did what's called an air attack, and on the second note, I tongued it. Now, tonguing is the rule. In most, if not all cases, we want to start our notes with the tongue. There are very, very few cases where you may want to use an air attack, which is the first note I played, but in most cases, you want to tongue them. So this is a very important concept to master. So the idea is this. We have our reed, and when we blow it, it makes a sound. But if we place our tongue on the bottom blade of the reed, or on the tip of the reed, the tip of our tongue, by the way, suddenly it stops the reed from vibrating, and I can't make a sound. In fact, I feel a lot of pressure. And the idea behind tonguing is this we are going to utilize that pressure to help us make a crisp attack. We're going to use a three-step process. Step one, breathe in. Just like we've been doing in the previous videos. Step two, when we bring the bassoon into our mouth, we're going to place our tongue on the reed just like we did just now. So when I try to breathe through the bassoon, no air will go through and the reed won't vibrate. And the most important part is that we're creating that pressure. Step three then is to simply release the tongue. I'll do it again. So 
So to reiterate, breathe in, set your tongue on the reed, add your air pressure, and release. Now, once you've mastered that tongue attack, what we can then do is start decreasing the time in between it takes us to set up and actually play the note. Once we minimize it all the way, we'll get a very legato sounding attack in tongue. Now this is a very good way to practice uh, setting up your tongue and releasing it. Now I would be remiss if I didn't mention that although we start our notes with the tongue, we in most cases do not stop notes with our tongue. That is, when we stop notes, we want to give it our full air and just decrease that air stream until the sound disappears and that'll give us a very nice taper to the end of the note. So for example You'll notice that my breath actually continued slightly past the time that the reed stopped vibrating and the bassoon stopped making a sound. So we want to tighten up our embouchure a tiny bit as we're doing this to taper off the sound and what it'll create is a very nice resonant sound. So when it comes to stringed instruments they're actually made of a hollow wooden body. However, as wind instruments, we don't have anything like this, so there's no natural resonance to the instrument. So by tapering off the end of our notes like this, what we are doing is creating an artificial resonance kind of sound that just gives it a very full, rich tone, and it's a much more beautiful way to end a note than just tongue-stopping it, which would be this. You'll notice it just didn't sound complete. It sounds more complete when we taper it off. So again, to reiterate, to taper it off, what we're going to do is we're going to slow down our airstream, but maintain that support until the sound cuts off. And we're going to have to tighten our embouchure as we do it as well to keep the pitch up. That concludes the section on tonguing.